So now we're going to get started with today's webinar, Farm Business Arrangements and Operating Structures with Merle Good and Mark Muchka, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mark at this point. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, it's Certainly we're kind of new at this webinar thing, but uh, it is kind of neat for both of us to do. We're going to talk for about 25 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And how we're going to go is we're going to start off by talking a little bit about uh, maybe some farm uh, land rental strategies you can start looking at that are becoming a little bit more important. And then for the rest of this webinar, Merle is going to talk a little bit about uh, partnerships and incorporations and partnership trusts. And then the following week, we'll get more into uh, incorporations and, and other things of the mix. So... Everyone can see my screen okay? Yes, we yep. can, Mark. There we go. Uh, in Alberta here, typically we, we only use a few land lease rental agreements. The reason being is our, our crops differ so much uh, in value from year to year. Uh, given our crop rotation, of course, we all like growing canola, um, but we also do have to grow other things like barley in the mix. And, uh, you know, that kind of sets us apart from other places in the states that have a lot more land rental options to them because they grow, you know, soybeans on corn and etc. and those relatively have the same uh, value at the end of the day. So we do see still a lot of crop sharing in the province, typically one-third, two-third, and landlords still like this arrangement because it allows them to keep their farming status. Um, the most common one, though, I think that we'll all agree on is, is just what's happening in the area and what the neighbor's paying. And I'm sure for those of you that, that rent land, and, and uh, Rick is going to ask, he's going to pull you guys to find out how many of you rent land in a bit. Um, but you'll know that you know, oftentimes there may be a landlord that comes to you and says, well, you know, the neighbor is now getting $70 an acre for his, you know, for his land, and you know, I'm only charging you $58. Um, we're going to need to adjust, and uh, whether that whether or not that's good or bad, I mean, it, it is what it is. As long as the landlord and renter are happy, that's a viable strategy. Um, if you're kind of looking at what maybe land rent should be in your area, there's a couple ways you can do this. Um, the first one is is looking at what the land is actually worth. So if you take a piece of land that's worth uh, two thousand dollars an acre as the real estate market. Uh, typically in Alberta, what we see is land uh, rental prices are about 3 to 3.5% three of, of the value of that. So in other words, landlords are getting about 3 to 3.5% return on their investment in that land. And so just something you can pencil out in your area to, to figure out maybe where land prices should fall. And then, of course, there's always uh, looking at just a fixed rent and then also including a market component to it by including uh, average prices and yields. Um, so these are probably, you know, the first two are, are what we see most common in Alberta, and I'm not going to talk about them today because you guys are all fairly familiar with them. Um, but we do want to talk about this third one here. And this third one we feel is becoming a bit more important uh, given the fact that it's just becoming generally more expensive to farm. Um, for those of us that have purchased equipment in the past year, we know, or two years, we know the significant investment that's required. And therefore, it's becoming more important to make sure we have a secure land base. Because when we purchase that equipment, you know, we cost it out over the number of acres we seed. And for those of us that rent land, let's say a third of our acreages, or acres, um, it could have a, a real catastrophic event to find out a year later we've lost a third of those acres to someone else. So, you know, um, a base cash rent strategy, we use it with what we call a flex payment, which allows you to flex for price or for price and yield. And how this uh, formula looks here is, you can see on the very left, we have base rent. And how do we calculate this? Well, Merle has been the one that's actually been crunching these numbers here, and, and he's been looking at AFSC crop insurance values. And he's kind of figured out that uh, a good base rent is about 20 to 25 percent of ASC crop insurance value. So, for instance, let's say kind of uh, a little bit west of the Highway 2 corridor, kind of down around, you know, south of Red Deer, 
we may see an AFSC crop insurance value of $220 an acre. 25% um, of this amount is $55 an acre for a base rent. And then what we're suggesting is to actually uh, change the price of this base rent based on what's happening in the market. And this allows the producers to share some of the risk and reward with the landlords. And you can use just price, uh, what's currently happening with price, or you can use yield and price. And I prefer to use both yield and price because I, I feel it uh, provides a little bit more of a fair return to both the landlord and the renter. Because if you didn't use yield as well and you just use price, you could have a, uh, a year where prices are quite high but yields are quite low, and you end up paying your landlord more but still have a, a fairly poor return on your crop. So that's why we suggest using both of those. And uh, we also suggest setting a floor and ceiling uh, for this rent as well. So in a bad year you can say to the landlord that um, the amount you'll pay will only go down 10% from the base rent. So that's his downside risk is a maximum 10% down. But uh, you know in terms of reward, he's got more upside potential and in a good year that you'll be willing to pay 20% more above what that base rent formula is. So kind of an incentive for him uh, to join in on this concept. And we suggest that you use a rolling lease where possible and I'm going to come back and talk to that in a, sec in a second. But I wanted to just give you an example of how this flexible cash rent would work. And on the left hand side of the screen here you can see in example one we have a lower than expected average yield. So if we plug our numbers into the formula, you know, we use a base rent, 25% you know, of AFSC insurance value, um, which in this case the example was $220. So our base rent is $55 an acre. And I took the 2009 prices here. And how I calculated the actual price is I decided with my landlord that we would take a spring price and a fall price and we would average the two. So last year's spring price was $10 fall price at the date we specified was $8, divided it by 2 and it gave us an actual price of $9. Over the past uh, five years though, the average for this crop has been $10. I'm using canola here. Um, so, so the actual price was a little bit below what the average has been over the past few years. And same thing with our yield. Um, typically in our area we yield about 35 bushels to the acres, pretty standard, um, you know, this past year we'll say for the purpose of the example we got 30 bushels to the acre. So we plug all these numbers in the formula and it may look complicated but it's, it's really not. And you can see that it would give us out a payment um, of $42.42 .42 an acre instead of that $55 an acre base rent because it's adjusted for uh, the market and the growing conditions. Now I'd also mention that we include only a 10% downward slide in the base rent uh, just to give the landlord some security. So if you use this 90% floor, um, we would actually pay them $49.50. So in other words, I'd save $5.50 per acre. And if I rent a thousand acres, you know, that's 5500 bucks. And maybe it doesn't seem like a lot, but uh, you know, it's all about incremental gains to the farm. And, and in a bad year, um, $5,500 could easily be, you know, 15-20% of your net farm income if you're an average sized farm. On the right hand side we took a higher than average expected yield. We kept all our no other numbers the same, you know, price is still $9, um, the base price is still $10, but I yielded 15 bushels an acre higher than normal. And you can see if there was no ceiling I would pay my landlord $70.71 per acre. Um, with the ceiling and that goes up by 20%, the amount I would actually pay him is $66 per acre. So the trade-off here, you know, I think most farmers agree that we would rather save a little bit more in a bad year than pay, pay a little bit more in a good year. And so that's kind of where this strategy comes in. So I'm missing a slide here for some reason, but it, that's okay. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about a rolling lease. And what a rolling lease allows you to do is it gives you some security uh, in terms of not, you have, you'll end up having a longer period of time uh, to rent that land than maybe in a standard lease. 
And let's say, for example, I enter into a, a rolling lease with my landlord, and we decide it's going to be a three-year term. And we're going to start at April 1 of this year, and it will continue in full force until April 1, 2013, at a minimum. So how it works is, if I haven't received anything in writing every year from my landlord, the lease is audibly re renewed, and I get an additional year put on to the lease. Um, for each year succeeding the commencement date. So the landlord and I decide that I'll have the land for at least two years before he can send me a letter saying he wants either the price adjusted or he wants to terminate the lease. So I have at least till 2012. And because it's a rolling lease, uh, he, it has to be in written notice. And this works out very good as it opens up lines of communications between the landlord and the renter. Um, in a lot of cases, what we'll find out is we'll, we'll sign up for just a normal fixed term lease and after the three years we found out that we've lost you know, the, the land to somebody else who's just going to pay a higher amount. So by him putting it in writing it allows you to turn around and address your concerns uh, and vice versa. So even if uh, he sends me a note uh, to terminate this lease uh, in 2012, I still have full control of that land for three more years from the date of that notice. So, you know, think about it from, again, going back to that idea that you're making all this purchase, purchase of equipment and machinery, uh, you just kind of have a little bit longer guarantees of farming uh, land. And that's also a benefit to the landlord as well, because they're not, not worried about every few years having to go back and renegotiate. Now, one of the drawbacks of a rolling lease is it doesn't necessarily lock in the price that you pay for the land. Uh, and I would suggest that maybe you put a clause in there that you can renegotiate the ran land rental rates every two years um, using an agreed upon method. Um, you might decide it's based on what the area average is. You might decide it's based on that uh, flexible cash rent lease we just talked about or maybe some other thing uh, that the two of you agree upon. So this is just to kind of show you here um, to put it out on a timeline for you, it, it seems a little bit of a complex uh, thing to do, but it's really not. So if we take our current time right now, let's say year one, we'll designate as this coming spring is April 1, 2010. The landlord and I enter into this agreement. And so year two comes, uh, 2011. Of course, we decided that you know he can't terminate the lease until 2012. So automatically I get another year tacked onto this lease. So I know I have it till year five. Now 2012 and 2013, he could send a letter saying, you know, I'm not happy with how this is working or, you know, I, I'm looking at terminating the lease. Now from that date, remember, you still have um, three years because of the way the ruling lease works. So that's kind of a timeline just to kind of show you how it would work and when the dates would come into effect. And in this instance, him and I decided we would renegotiate in price in uh, 2012 and 2014, which is year three and five of this agreement. And then um, the ruling lease expires in 2016 if no letter is received ever. And the reason this is is we just set you know, um, the fact that it could only be extended for three years. So that's why I chose that date there of 2016. So I'm going to stop there, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Merle, and he's going to continue on from this point. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Mark. Uh, uh, hello to everyone who's on the webinar. I really appreciate uh, Rick doing this for us. It allows us to, to meet a large audience throughout the province and uh, cuts down on the mileage, so we really appreciate this. Uh, just a couple comments on the, uh, on the cash rent. We spent a little bit of time on that this idea of business structures and arrangements because that's one of the biggest uh, agreements that you as grain farmers have is with landlords. And um, I want to uh, you guys to look at your operation on this uh, percentage of crop insurance. If all you take away from this complicated talk, and some people have said it's pretty complicated and appreciate Mark uh, going through it because it is in certain ways but not in others as he's mentioned. But just look at your cash rent. I'd like to have any feedback over the next couple of weeks of uh, look at your crop insurance coverage. Uh, the cash rent in your area, does it track between that 20 and 25% of your crop insurance area, area average? 
I think it will um, you know, on, on a blend of crops. And if it does, I think this is kind of a neat way to uh, try to link cash rent to an insurable product. And uh, as I spoke yesterday in Red Deer, uh, some of your landlords aren't going to be uh, the present generation. They'll be children that have been left land who live in Calgary, and they have no idea what the normal rent is or anything to do with agriculture. And if we could actually show them a contract from the crop insurance to say pick 22%, you've got a flexible cash rent every year. Um, I do like the idea of the price and the yields, but if you want to make it very simple, just have a flexible cash rent based on crop insurance coverage. So please get back to Mark or I. We'd like to talk to you about this concept. and Maybe we can uh, uh, tie rent uh, to what you can afford to pay um, uh, through an insurance product. So once again, please get back to us and we'll try to develop this together uh, for the industry. So the next one I'm going to talk about is business structures uh, for the last uh, part of the presentation. And this slide in front of you right now I think is really, really, really important in uh, intergenerational farms where there's more than one generation farming together. And uh, regardless of what your accountant does, I mean, forget tax for a second. I would like you to sit down together with your uh, son or daughter who's farming with you and go down and look at this ways of how you get money out of a business. And uh, at Farm Tech, we spoke on this a little bit, and most of the people in that room were corporations, but we'll ask for that, I guess, in one of our questions here. But if we sit down and look at this slide, this tells me how I get uh, uh, income out of a company, or income out of a partnership, or income even a sole proprietorship, if you wish. But if you do these categories, it really helps to understand why the farm is paying you a compensation. So for example, uh, if I'm 72 years old and my son does all the work, maybe my labor uh, return is almost zero. The management, of course, may be zero. But you know, I look at this and say, hey, I own uh, seven quarters of land at uh, 50 bucks an acre cash rent. That is the company's going to pay me for uh, a land rent. So as long as we understand what you're pulling the money out for, it opens up a lot of communication about uh, what is fair and, and equitable among these draws. And the last one I'll show you here is this capital redemption. And that one I think is really important and I'll talk about it in a few minutes with companies, but that is where at the end of the day perhaps the father and mother, most corporations who are set up in the last seven to eight years have huge preferred share value. And I think uh, we have to look at redeeming those uh, preferreds so that the second generation gets a capital appreciation on the common shares. So it's just a way I want you to go down that list, and I don't care what your accountant does for tax purposes. I think for management purposes is to sit down and look at those different options and uh, try to get your accountant to explain those to you. And uh, what I would suggest to you this year when you go in to do your uh, or receive your account, receive your uh, year-end uh, tax package, uh, perhaps you throw this slide and print it off and uh, walk in the accountant's office and say, hey, Let's talk about these uh, issues for the next year going forward as to how we work uh, and pull income out of these farms. Okay, Mark, we'll go to the next one, please. Just to show you again, the uh, uh, corporate uh, tax rates in Alberta, I'm strongly, strongly recommending that uh, farmers, uh, if you're not incorporated, you almost have to if you're running a commercial size operation. Uh, the only reason I would not incorporate in Alberta is if your farm is developing and you have losses on a cash basis and you want to apply those losses to off-farm income. Otherwise, I think if you have to look at a company, uh, the, uh, over the years people are quite nervous about corporations. Uh, I think you'll find they're not hard to operate, especially if you don't have a lot of land in the company. So we have more flexibility in our succession planning, which I'll talk about uh, next week. But you can see these rates. I mean, uh, as Mark uh, mentioned in farm tech, the income and expenses in farming are gyrating unreal in, in variability, and we cannot afford to have a non-flat tax rate. In 2008, when you guys had tremendous income because of the rise in grain prices, uh, you have to have this sheltering of a 14% flat tax rate up to half a million. And uh, there again, if you have that flat rate, you'll make better management decisions of when to buy your inputs rather than just at year end. And as we talked at Farm Tech this year, is kind of interesting. If you look at fertilizer prices, the lowest value was in June. So I'll guarantee you the only guy who bought the fertilizer cheapest last year was those who had a July 1st year end. <laughs> 
because you do look at buying these inputs for tax purposes rather than math purposes. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. Um, partnerships. Um, the reason I'm going to bring them up is if you're not in a large taxable income position and the fact that you are potentially developing your farm and having losses as you go forward and have off-farm income, this strategy is really, really, really important. Uh, I spoke yesterday in Red Deer, and this is one strategy. We've mentioned it a couple times in farm tech over the years, uh, but I want to reiterate that if you're not in a company presently, and I'll say this uh, three or four times right now, if you're not in a company presently, I want you to seriously look at forming a partnership or determining if you already have a partnership with your spouse. Because if you have a partnership, you have to understand that you don't own cattle machinery inventory. What you'll own is a piece of paper called a partnership interest. And under the Income Tax Act, a partnership interest and a corporate share is treated uh, exactly the same as land for purposes of the capital gains exemption. So what this slide is showing, let's assume we have a, a father-son arrangement they're not into a, a taxable income position and they're just developing the farm, let's say, or perhaps a wife. What we can do here is it's called a partnership freeze. And what we're doing is we're actually saying, look, uh, dad and mom, you were going to get a, uh, a capital interest, which means uh, you no longer have any increase in value, same as a preferred share. And the income interest will grow, like a common share, will go to the uh, son or daughter who's farming with you. So what we can do, exactly like a company, where you have a preferred share, which is a froze, froze value share, a common share is a gross share, we do the same thing in a partnership. Uh, very few accountants use this strategy, but I think it's a, a very uh, neat one to use as uh, a progression from a sole proprietorship. You have a partnership down the road, you can actually freeze this partnership, allow the son or daughter to have growth in that partnership, and then of course, is the next slide. This is where we want to get to. And what this slide is, it's quite complicated, but uh, I thought we'd put this out to you today in a little bit of detail, because with this webinar, with Rick and I were talking, what's so neat about this, you guys can print this and then take it to your account. And I do a, a tremendous amount of work with accountants, so we put on a course every year, Mark and I, with uh, 700 accountants throughout the province. So we're doing a little bit of plug for our seminars in November. Yeah, make anyway, sure your accountants like, go. Yeah, exactly. So to make this, look, what this slide's all about is once you create this partnership and it has significant value in it, then we'll sell it. And we'll sell it to your newly formed farm company. Now what this does is create a very unique strategy, and I mentioned yesterday in Red Deer, this is only available to farmers. No other taxpayer in Canada has this right to do this. So what we're doing, we're taking a partnership interest. This example, it's worth a million dollars. Dad has 700, mom 200, and son 100,000. We're going to sell these to the company. We're going to claim the capital gains deduction. And with, by doing that, we get a shareholder's loan. So in this case, dad will get a $500,000 shareholder's loan. Mom will get 200, and son 100. So what we've done is convert income uh, machinery, inventory, into a tax-paid shareholder's loan. Those who have companies on the phone call today will realize how important a shareholder's loan is. The only way you, most people create shareholder's loans is by selling land to a company. And most farmers don't want to do that because of flexibility issues. So instead of selling land, this strategy allows you to sell your inventory and your equipment to the company. You get a shareholder's loan, as discussed here, and that results in no taxable income to you because it's a loan. So when the company makes its income, it pays the 14% flat rate up to a half a million, and then as you extract cash from the company, there is no more further personal tax. It's not a salary, it's not a land rent, and nor is it a dividend. It's repayment of a shareholder's loan, which results in no taxable income to you. So to cap this a little bit, where do we use this strategy? Um, if it's possible to use this, I like to use it <laughs> on everyone if I could, because what it does, it, it creates a couple of neat options. Uh, one, the farming uh, older generation has a retirement income which they can use now as repayment of shareholders' loans. They effectively will have no personal income tax on money received from the farm. 
that allows you to reduce the draw by 35% because normally you guys would take money out of the company and you're in 30% tax bracket. So we're cutting Revenue Canada out of our compensation package by 35%. So instead of paying you this amount of money, we can reduce your draw from the business. It's a great strategy and only the only one losing, of course, is Revenue Canada. So that helps the cash flow of the farm business. It also lowers your effective tax rate on your Canada pension, RSPs, or RIFs, depending on your age, as, as you retire uh, uh, through the government uh, support programs, and also your own RSP, of course. So I think that's a great strategy for the uh, other generation. Uh, secondly, what this does, normally when we do these, the uh, common shares then go to the uh, second generation, which of course increases in value as you pay off the shareholder's loan. So my objective on these uh, companies and partnerships is to land up where that the second generation will own the operating company well before uh, the, maybe the transfer of land will take on later, but the actual transfer of the operating company will happen a lot sooner. Next slide, Mark. Okay, just at an interest stake here too, um, Rick is going to pop up a little poll for you guys just to figure out uh, kind of where we're at in terms of our listenership, how many of us are partnerships or incorporations. So once you see that come up, click on that. Oh, neat. You should have added one more category, gentlemen. Hell if I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, in, a, in a joke, when you guys are filling this, uh, this poll out, I'm, I, I can guarantee you, uh, in most farm uh, audiences, if I sat down with them afterwards and said, who owns the cows um, or who owns the machinery, uh, it seems like kind of a funny uh, terminology, but I've seen it where that, the uh, taxpayers or the farmers say, well, of course I own it, but they have a company. So it's interesting to make sure that you understand, do you own what you think you own? Merle, I'm not sure if the results will show up on screen, so just in okay, case they don't, go. we're at 26% sole proprietorship, 20% okay. partnership, 41% corporation, and 13% other. Oh, there you okay. go. Okay, yeah, there you go. So. Uh, Going back to my question, the 26% who are in a proprietorship now, I really, really, really want you to talk to your accountants about forming a husband and wife partnership if you don't already, because sometimes you guys say you're in proprietorship, but sometimes you split income for tax purposes. Really look at that because over time, that allows you then to build up all your equity in this partnership. It doesn't change your tax filing position at all. And then when you actually wish to either A, expand and have a company, or even this is probably just as important in agriculture at the present time. There's a lot of you guys on this call are going to look at your operations. There is no successor. Uh, your neighbor kid who's 27 to 35 has been bugging you about renting your land anyways. And this is a neat strategy to exit. Because a lot of you will make money when? The day you decide to have the farm sale. If you sell your inventory and don't buy back next year, you also have your recapture depreciation on equipment. What's neat about this strategy is you only pay 14% tax to exit the industry. So that's why I think you really have to look at that. Some issues, I want you to take this to your accountant as well. It's, uh, I'm not going to go through it all, but if you take this little slide to them, and uh, we do recommend that if you do some work with your accountants, we can't see, of course, everyone in the province on an individual basis, so we try to work through accountants. Take this to them, and if the accountant says, what the hell is Merle and Mark talking about, have them call us. That way we can actually work through this, and then we're educating not only the farmers of Alberta, but we're also educating your, your advisors. Uh, one point here on, on this slide, you take it to your accountant. The one thing is the stub period income. I won't get into that, but it's kind of a neat uh, technical strategy that perhaps the income that you have can be, can be shown by the company. So I, won't, I don't have time here to go through all of this, but uh, that's something you want to go. So one more thing. And then we'll wrap it up, I guess, because we only have half an hour. As next slide. So here's an example going back to those five categories that I talked about uh, of return on, on income and, and how to get uh, uh, money out of a company. What I'm showing here is just to show an example. By doing this, this is an actual example we had with a uh, family farm. And you can see where Dad has a million dollars of uh, capital in the, in the company. Uh, you know, I'm not. That could be land and or just equity in the in the corporation through machinery and, and et cetera. And the son only has 100. What I'm trying to show here was, uh, guess who has to do most of the labor to get their 40,000 out? So you look at that last slide. 
the last line I should say, dad's only have to dad only has to do ten thousand dollars worth of work to extract sixty thousand. Where son has to do thirty thousand dollars of work to extract forty. And what this does in a two generational farm situation is to kind of indicate why you can return or receive income from a business. Not just because you're working there, but those categories. And by doing that, I think you'll find a lot of chance, a lot of uh, communication streams can be opened up. So in this example, um, son, guess who's got to calve the cows at 2 o'clock in the morning? And uh, so it helps open up that discussion of roles and responsibilities and compensation for those roles and responsibilities. And uh, I'd like to spend uh, another uh, webinar on this sometime, uh, Rick, is to actually go through a live example of something like this to show how this can actually work and really make a difference in uh, on two generational farms. So do we have any time left or is that it? We have as much time as people want to stay online for. We do have some questions coming in, so I'll let you decide. Okay, maybe, we'll ask, ask, maybe we'll do some, answer some questions if they want. Okay, our first question is from Bernadette. She asks, is the spring and fall prices established by AFSC crop insurance prices? Um, the answer is no. You could use that, certainly, if you wanted to. Um, you can use any prices you'd like. Um, what, you know, in the example I was giving there, we were just saying, pick a date. You know, maybe it's uh, April 1st, and then again it's October 1st. Pick two dates uh, that you both agree upon. Uh, you can come to those any way you want. You could instead just use the forecasted prices that are out in the market. AFSC values would also work. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, my comment on that is it's, it's up to you which ones you use. Of course, poured grains are harder to use than off-board, so you may want to just use the pros, which gives you an example of what the change in the, in, in the shift of, of the prices has done. Um, where this came from is a friend of mine owns Lance Saskatchewan, and on the price one, all they do is do an index on price change uh, on the termination. And they don't use yield. They just use price. And... Uh, to get that 10 or 20 percent up or down on, on the actual flexible cash, or if it's a fixed cash rent, you just move up and down on those on those two set price points, as Mark discussed. Okay, our next question comes from Barry. Is there an alternate minimum tax that has to be paid with the partnership to corporation transfer? Okay, the question is on the sale of a partnership interest or a corporate share, or sorry, on the sale of a capital asset to a company. Uh, yes, there is an alternative of minimum tax that is required to be paid, which can be as high as $40,000 approximately on a $750,000 exemption. But you do get all that back. So when I tell the people, when you can cut your tax rate from, four, from 28 to 35 down to 14 for the rest of your life, paying the AMT uh, with your talk, if you have to borrow the money from the bank to pay the alternative minimum tax, if you can get it, say, for a three-year loan, based on your farm and you're paying maybe 5% interest on that loan, uh, of course, you will get all the money back guaranteed on the AMT payment because of the fact you are going to pay taxes uh, for over a seven-year period. Um, so I think an AMT is an issue, but of course, um, I think it's still, I believe, a uh, cost that is way, 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 way uh, offset by the uh, tax-free uh, income coming from the company for the next 25 years. Good question, by the way. And we had a suggestion from Jerry that we could have another webinar just talking about the issue slide. And then a question from Gordon. Is the RIO just the cash received, or does it include the increase in value of land? Do you want to answer? I, uh, Mark, you go ahead first, and I'll give you my interpretation. Sorry, the RIO? That was your return on land on 3.5%. Three, three oh, yes, land. the return on... Does it include, sorry, which? Does it include? Uh, that is just that is just looking at that is just looking at the land value itself. So the market value that is from a landlord's perspective is if they're holding this land, um, you know, typically most of them may be making payments on it, and uh, all that is showing is that if you're looking at it from a landlord's perspective, rent in the province seems to be falling between three and three and a half percent return on investment on that land. Um, I just was crunching some numbers the other day and looking at land rent prices in various areas versus 
uh, what the land is worth, and that's that's kind of where it's falling. So it just kind of gives you an idea, you know, are you paying maybe more than that, or are you paying less than that? Um, just a way of looking at it, that's all that was. Uh, I think it's an important point, though. I think that's why we're focusing on this uh, on this rental uh, cost of acquiring this rented land. Um, we have to have something that will reflect our risk and reward better than strictly these cash rents. Um, some of you guys were on crop share in 208. You paid up to a high uh, cash. You paid, paid as much on a one third, two thirds crop share in uh, the Disbury area as a high as $140 an acre rent. And uh, so I guess, I mean, our hearts are in the farming side, not necessarily the landlord side in, in some ways. And uh, my comment here really boils down into they're not willing to share any capital appreciation with you, of course, because they own the land. And so I believe if we can convince these producers that are retiring and renting their land out, um, is there a way we can lower this rent? Uh, because as farmers, you guys know that the last six or seven years, when you have a really good year like 208 or 207, it doesn't happen very often. In fact, it's happened once in the last nine years where you made that kind of revenue on your operations. And I don't think we can give that stuff away uh, because replacement of equipment and the challenges in operating a successfully quite large grain operation, or even a small grain operation, um, just requires us to have, as Mark said, those incremental changes in our cost structures, uh, especially on the land rent. And uh, so that's why we're kind of working on this and, and uh, trying to get it down. If we can get some volatility out of this and get the landlords maybe educated, uh, as I said earlier, we are getting more and more people who are uh, one generation away from owning property, and we have to somehow uh, uh, look at this uh, educational role. I know a lot of farmers tell me after they hear this talk, they say, oh, great, Merle's great philosophical discussion, but if I want the damn land, I've got to pay this price. And the market will always determine what the value is, regardless of, of uh, different options. But the same token is you have to look at it in your own operation and, and pick it up an extra 1,000 acres if it's 25 miles away. just may not be that such a smart move um, on some of the operating capital concerns we have. We talked about last uh, seminar, and that is uh, there again, as this year goes along, we're seeing more and more pressure on operating loan increases. Okay, we have a question from Brian. Is it better to keep land in the corporation or outside of it and own it personally? I'll take the first stab on that. Um, it just depends. Um, what land in a company, there's nothing wrong with putting land in a corporation uh, because, of course, it's a corporate asset. It's the best way to pay for land as you're acquiring it. So what I tell a lot of people is that if and when you're buying new property, you're probably going to have to purchase it in the corporate name because it is the one that has the income, okay? Having said that, that new acquisition of land doesn't hold the family ties to the stuff that your great-grandfather owned. So I don't think it's as big as issue uh, if that land is owned by the company with new purchases. Reason why we don't like a lot of land in a company is because not to do with the business, it's to do with your estate planning or succession planning, uh, because if everything's in one pot, then, of course, if you want to leave a certain amount of your equity into uh, a non-active farm child, then, of course, that person will own shares in that farming son or daughter's active farm. And believe me, very few of those work without a whole bunch of uh, shareholders agreements. So if, for flexibility, we like the land in uh, outside owned personally, but I do concede that if you're going to purchase it, it has to go through a company most likely if you have a corporation as your operating vehicle. Okay, comment from Wayne that this is a nice thing to do with the morning coffee. How about an 8 a.m. start? Uh, the webinar Q&A. How about a F uh, frequently asked question section? Thanks, Wayne. We're going to look at uh, what time works best starting with our first couple of ones. We just wanted to make sure we had everything running correctly. And we will look at uh, what the questions are and maybe providing some more links in the webinar section of our website. A question from Bernadette. I qualified our farm business as being a partnership. However, I'm not certain if it is a true partnership. For tax purposes, all capital purchase and sale, farm income and expense are, and then that's sort of where it, the question ended. Okay, this is, <laughs> this goes back to my question, do you own what you think you own? Um, 
Yes, uh, most accountants, um, we, uh, we call them partnerships by default, where the, you go to the account and the accountant says, hey, we should split income. And he says, so for this year, we're going to start splitting the income 70-30. So when you guys look at your tax returns, it's got a net income figure after depreciation, all your, all your fine statements, and it says, okay, dad, you get 70, and mom, you get 30, whatever the split is. As far as revenue looks at that, they've assumed you've created a partnership. Now, in law, accountants and lawyers love to see a partnership agreement. But uh, notwithstanding that comment, if you have filed your return for years and years consecutively on that basis, uh, we're pretty comfortable that you have a qualified, as you called it, family farm partnership for purposes of this strategy that we've talked about of selling the partnership interest. Um, it's quite complex. It's not easy. And it's not, usually what farmers ask me, what's the cost? To, to execute these strategies, and they're quite popular now in the last seven years, uh, the average runs about 3500 bucks uh, to 4000 between the accounting fees and the legal fees to actually set up a company, sell your partnership to the company, create the shareholder's loan, runs around that number. And our last question I have on screen, oh, another one came in, but we have a question from Barry. In our area, where land is worth five hundred to six hundred dollars per acre, typical land rent is twenty-five to thirty-five dollars. So the three to three and a half percent does not fit into Mark's calculation. Hey Mark, you can comment on that. So uh, at at three and a half percent, in other words, um, you're probably paying. You said it's twenty-five dollars an acre in land rent. Is that what you said? Right? Uh, yeah, the land's worth five to six hundred, and typical land rent is twenty-five to thirty-five. Yeah. So what he's finding is he's paying a little bit more than maybe what that calculation shows. Um, I would assume that in the area, you know, I guess look at the next alternative use. Um, in most areas, the only use if people are holding land is typically the you know farm and oat. Um, um, I would say in this case, look at what all the neighbors are paying, and your going rate is probably around that twenty-five mark, twenty twenty-five dollars per acre mark uh, everywhere. And uh, I mean, I don't know what part of the area he's from, um, or part of the province he's from, but uh, I mean, I, I guess I don't see that as as being something that would be completely out of the norm. It just seems for most area of the provinces now, if you take land that's a thousand dollars an acre, you know, some of it maybe up in the peace country and they're paying $35 an acre. It falls in that range. Central Alberta, $2,000 an acre, um, falling in the $60, $65 range. That's that's generally where things are falling. I, I wouldn't read maybe too much into it if it's outside that range. I'll, I'll concur on Mark's comment. Uh, the only thing I'm saying, which is interesting on a, on a finance basis, if you've got land in an area that's only selling for $500 an acre, and you're paying $35 an acre to rent it or whatever it was, God's sakes, buy it. Yeah. <laughs> because I'll tell you right now, uh, what I use as a rule of thumb, if you can buy land in the province for two times cash rent, you're better off to own it by far than you are to lease it. And I'll just explain that to you. If you put down half down on that land, sir, your rental rates would pay for your mortgage. And there's nowhere else in the province we can do that right now. So I don't know where you're at, but it's great. I mean, you, you, you know, and I, I, I know where you're at. You're not near anything like Calgary, Edmonton, or Red Deer because the price of land is, is not anywhere close to productive value. It's to fair market value. But if any time, uh, that, that number of two times cash rent, if any times you can buy land for two times cash rent on an amortized basis, I'll guarantee you over time you'll be in a better position 10 years from now than renting it. So I would say uh, give us your phone number and uh, uh, we'll talk about buying some land out there. <laughs> Because it's, that's a good chance. And it's interesting you mentioned that because in Saskatchewan, there was a gentleman from there uh, at Farm Tech, and he said the same thing, that when we sat down and talked to him, that he could buy land quite easily in his area for two times cash rent. And I'm thinking, my God, uh, well, you know, that was the far northeast part of the province, very productive land, kind of like Peace River, kind of like Fairview, he was telling me. And so you might lose a crop every five years, a portion of it because of weather. But, man, that's, that's, that's good agricultural investment rather than land speculation, which is we have in the majority of the Highway 2 uh, corridor. Uh, Merle, quick question from Brian. Are you comfortable with having accountants and tax lawyers calling you? Yes. That's probably 
much more than I can answer all the different. Because I'll be honest with you, if your accountants call us on your situation and we can help them understand some of the nuances, then maybe we're helping 150 of his clients in the same area. So we definitely would take calls from accountants and lawyers directly a, a bunch because that's really, I think, a better way to extend our joint knowledge to the industry. And certainly you can have your accountant go to our website and watch any of these as well as uh, Merle's contact information is there. Maxine, yeah, that's a good idea. Sure. Maxine says, if we have been crossing out partnership on tax returns and have put joint venture, have we got around partnership by default? That's a very good question. Um, you probably have. And there's no, I have nothing wrong with joint ventures whatsoever. Um, we promoted them a lot, and I still like them uh, a lot when we go from uh, bringing a son or a daughter back to the farm or a husband wife split of income. The only thing I would, I would uh, at those times, we didn't have this ability to use the exemption on a sale of a partnership interest. So um, if you're not going that route, where that you're saying, hey, we're never going to worry about forming a company on our farm, it doesn't seem to be in the cards for us, we're not in that high taxable income brackets, uh, stay with your joint venture. There's nothing wrong with that. Or if you want to go into this strategy, either I as an exit strategy or to grow your farm or you are getting that taxable income concern, talk to your accountant and we'll switch you. And we'll change in the GST numbers and we'll change in your bank accounts. We'll do some paperwork and slowly move you over to a partnership and then do this strategy if you want. Hey, Barry mentions he is in East Central Alberta. And the last question I've got on the screen right now, for, it comes from Peter. What kind of annual cost should I expect to maintain a corporate structure? Ooh, uh, accountants always hate me when I do this. <laughs> How's $30,000? And then, all, then all the accounts will be happy. <laughs> no, uh, most uh, Central Alberta accounts that we work with charge around $1,200 to $2,000 to do an annual corporate because you're also looking at usually personal returns in that package and it depends and that's just basic I mean we're not talking about any kind of uh, change of uh, share structures or anything like that or legal agreements just the annual filing so your accounting costs will probably be 60 to 100 percent higher than you would if you remained as a sole proprietorship but oh I forgot to mention your accounting fees are deductible too all accounts tell me I remind everyone about that <laughs> Okay, that was the last question we had, so I think we'll wrap things up here. Again, thanks to, uh, to Mark and Merle for the time they spent with, as well as everybody online. We appreciate you joining us. And please do send your ideas and suggestions to me by email or give me a call, because uh, we're certainly interested in doing more of these, and not just on the management stream, but also on the agronomy side of things. Again, any of our webinar information, you can find everything on our website at canola.av.ca. Uh, this particular webinar should be up within about 24 hours. Mark and Merle will send me their presentations, so I will also put a link to that uh, to their presentations in a printable form if you want to look over it again. And with that, we're going to wrap things up and thank everybody. Again, a reminder that next week we have a webinar on succession planning. So when the invitation comes, please sign up and please pass it along to anyone else you think might have value. Again, on behalf of the Alberta Canola Producers, thank you for attending today.